I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to our scripture this morning is John chapter 14. John 14, starting with verse 15. I'm going to read verses 15 through 17. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I'm going to turn the time over to the pastor. He's on your side. He's an advocate. God sent him especially for you. So you don't have to live in sin. You don't have to face all the struggles in this life. You have the Holy Spirit. He's an advocate. He's a helper. And the Greek, it calls it a paraclete, one who stands beside you. But you know there are conditions you know that. I mean, it's just not available to just anybody. Scripture says that if you love me, obey my commandments. Well, yes, I love him and, you know, obey his commandments when I can. You know, it's not always convenient to obey his commandments. But I, so does that count? Is that loving him? I will ask the Father. So Jesus is saying, I'm asking the Father father for this gift he will give you another advocate Jesus is already an advocate Jesus is already on the people's side but there's going to be another advocate to come because Jesus has work to do after his death after his resurrection after his ascension in heaven so there's going to be a Holy Spirit an advocate and he will never leave you there's a rumor going around that the Holy Spirit is withdrawing, and then we're going to have to face the world all by ourselves. That's not what the Bible promise is. Yes, the Holy Spirit will leave the world, but it will not leave us. You can count on that. So where are we in the story here? Jesus had just had the Last Supper. He was starting out toward the uh, Brook Kidron. He was going to cross it, get up. Uh, go over to the Garden of Gethsemane, which is really an olive orchard, but he isn't there yet. And so he is giving some more instructions to the disciples of just what they need to know because the next few hours are going to be really faith-shaking for them. He's warned them, he's told them, he's given all kinds of information exactly what's going to happen, but they don't believe it because they don't believe it could happen, not to their leader. He is the Holy Spirit who leads in the all truth. This advocate is going to help them understand truth, and there is a definite shortage of that in this world right now. We've got all kinds of people wanting your side on a number of issues, and they aren't playing fair. You probably figured that out. They aren't always telling the truth. But the Holy Spirit leads into all truth. The world can't receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. You know, we all ignore stuff that is just so plain. How in the world can the evolutionists deny that there is a God? Well, they don't want to recognize there's a God, and so they ignore him. And the scientists, as we found in our seminar, are saying, you know, we've got to, even though it looks like there's a creator here, we've got to ignore that fact. We've got to make sure that God is not a part of any one of our theories. And we will just develop more theories and more theories, and we will convince people that God is not a part of this. It isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him. Because he lives with you now, and here's an interesting thing. He lives with you now, 
and later will be in you. Well, Jesus is the one who's living with them now, but when the Holy Spirit comes, he will live in them. Well, that would be the goal, right? That would be the thing to have. Do you think we can sin with the Holy Spirit living in us? He says, no, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Well, Jesus had already told them he's leaving. Well, where are you going? Well, I'm leaving, but I'll be back. I won't abandon you as orphans. And even after I ascend to heaven, the Holy Spirit will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. You will recognize his righteousness, his goodness, all the glory that he has. Since I live, you also will live. Another promise of hope. That's what the disciples needed. And they're going to forget all of this, just like we forget everything when we come to a crisis situation. We forget, well, now what do I do? Well, we've been taught what to do, but we forget. Well, we've studied what to do, but we forget. Well, sometimes when tragedy happens, we need to just stop and think and say, Lord, help me remember what I've been taught. Help me to remember your promises. It's a really difficult situation, but you know, God's promises are true. When I'm raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. What does that mean? Well, there's a family resemblance. You will have the kind of character you need to have. But, you know, this is after he's raised to life again. From this time until he's raised to life again, boy, the disciples are going through real torment. Because we didn't expect him to die. We didn't expect him to be abused. We didn't expect him to be tortured on the cross. No, that was not a part of their plan. And of course, they had no hope. They didn't believe while he was laying there in the grave. And even when he was resurrected and the rumors started going around, the, the ladies were telling the story and, and Peter and John says, he's not in the tomb, what do we do? And they get together in the last, in the, uh, last place they had been, the upper room there, and uh, those two from Emmaus come back and telling their story, we've seen him, he's alive, and they're all, can it possibly be true? Because they had already said in their minds it can't be true. But when I'm raised to life again, you will know that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. And it finally happens. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. Well, here he's saying it twice. Must be important. What's he want? To accept his word, to do what he asks us to do. They are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my father will love him or them. And people say, ah, come on, that can't be true. God loves everyone. Well, yeah, in a sense he loves everyone, but he has to destroy the wicked. But he loves those who love Jesus. I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. To each of them. Individually he will receive, reveal himself. It's not like you're going to be at a camp meeting and all of a sudden God reveals himself. Well, he does that sometimes too. But each one of you will have a personal experience. And many of you already have. And hopefully most of you will have that shortly. I don't have much more time to talk to you because the ruler of this world approaches. The ruler of this world, well, in John 13, Jesus already said the devil entered into Judas. And Judas is approaching. Well, the devil can't be in more than one place at a time. So here is Judas coming, and the devil is in him. He's approaching. Ruler of this world. He has no power over me. You don't have to worry about him. I will do what the Father requires of me. They won't get that at all. They think, well, God requires that he protect himself. The 10,000 angels. Nope. So that the world will know that I love the Father. 
Jesus will do obedience. He will do exactly what God wants him to do. Come, let's, get, let's be going. It was time for supper. The devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. There it is. The devil has already entered him. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and he would return to God. Jesus knew his mission. Jesus was not worried about the devil. And neither should we be concerned about the devil because the Holy Spirit, our advocate, has greater power than the devil ever thought about having. Well, maybe he thought about it, but it's not working. But I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father, and will testify all about me. And you must also testify about me. This is a part of the obedience. This is a part of the commandment. Tell your testimony about Jesus. When Jesus came into your life, when Jesus has done amazing things for you, when Jesus has given you strength over the devil, that's what he wants you to do. Testify about me, because you have been with me from the beginning of my ministry. When people are confused, give them something to do. That'll help them straighten out. I've told you things so that you won't abandon your faith. And they were real close to abandoning their faith. They believed in Jesus, but these things were so upsetting to them, they didn't know where to go next. You will be expelled from the synagogues, <coughs> the time is coming when those who kill you will think they're doing a holy service for God. Well, that's happened for hundreds of years. People thought they were doing God's righteousness when they get rid of the infidels, when they get rid of the Christians, when they get rid of those people who don't believe just as they believe. This is because they have never known the Father or me. That's it. They don't know God. They don't know love. They don't know peace. God's purpose was to restore the world to peace. They had peace in the very beginning. Peace is what they had in the uh, Garden of Eden. And God would love to restore peace. Well, they don't know that peace. They don't know God. And they'll not ever get that peace. In fact, it's best for you that I go away because if I don't, the advocate won't come. Jesus has to leave. Remember, Jesus was in his human form, one place, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, can be in many places. The Holy Spirit's presence is right here in this church. He is across town. He's in Wenatchee, in those churches there at this time. He's over there in the Nigawa church in Japan. He's over there in Africa to the churches there. He is everywhere. That's what our advocate, that's what our Holy Spirit can do. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And Jesus definitely was going to go away. And when he comes, he's going to do these things, three things. He's going to convict the world of its sin because when righteousness shows up, sin becomes pretty plain. When the light gets turned on, you can see what the trouble is. Well, that's part of the Holy Spirit. He convicts of sin. And he will show what God's righteousness is really like. And he will show that there's going to be a coming judgment. Judgment, of course, is what worries most people. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. Judgment will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. Since he's already been judged, Jesus is just about to gain the victory on the cross. He's been judged, and all who follow him, all who've been deceived by him, they will be judged right along with him, and that's still coming. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own but he will tell what he has heard. He is in the presence of God. He's heard what Jesus has been doing. That's what he will share with you. And he will tell you about the future. Tell about the future. 
Do we need to know what the stock prices are gonna do next week? Do we need to know what the new COVID rules are gonna be next week? Do we need to know what's gonna happen in uh, the uh, European market next week? No. He will tell us the future. He will tell us about what God has planned for each one of you. That's the future you should be interested in. That's the future that counts, that God's promises are true. God's promises are faithful. And in spite of what the world may do, in spite of what uh, the devil may arrange to have happen, God's promises will be true. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. The Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. Yes, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with spiritual powers. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. So you want to do good, but those forces are troubling. But if you've got the Holy Spirit, he can resist that for you. Since we're living by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes, put on your new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Well, people say, well, that's not going to happen. No way am I going to be righteous and holy. Have you given the Holy Spirit a chance? Has the Holy Spirit really been allowed to work in your lives so that you don't follow the sinful desires? Don't stifle the Holy Spirit. Don't scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, who lives with in us, carefully guard the precious truth that has been entrusted to you. In our final text here, in Jesus was revealed as God's son. By his baptism in water and by shedding his blood on the cross, not by water alone, but by water and the blood. And the spirit, who is truth, confirms it with his testimony. So Jesus was baptized, big event. Jesus shed his blood on the cross, big event. And the Spirit gives testimony to all this that it is true, another big event. And these three agree. So we have three witnesses, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and all three agree. Okay, one more text. Humans can reproduce only human life the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. That's our goal. The Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. That's what he wanted his disciples to recognize, to know. Because they're going to live only by the power of the Holy Spirit from then on. Well, we're going to have foot washing. Invite the men to go downstairs. It's been prepared. Ladies, we'll go off to the room here. It's been prepared for you. And we will, just as Jesus did, wash each other's feet. Come back here and partake of the bread and the juice representing Christ's life.